So my name is Scott Hagen, and I'm a professor here at LSU in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And I have a half-time appointment in the Center for Computation and Technology. And I have the honor of introducing our speaker today. And the speaker is being hosted by the LSU Office of Research and Economic Development. And I wanted to invite our speaker because he's one of the world's leading experts on cultural resilience. Why do I say that? Well, just go to Google Academic Scholar, type in coastal resilience, and see whose publications come up. Long before we were thinking about resilience in the United States, he was publishing on resilience. Back in 1998, he published a, an article in a conference proceedings that really set the stage for a lot of what we're trying to accomplish today. So it's my great honor to introduce Robert Nichols, who is a professor in coastal engineering, member of the faculty of engineering and the environment at the University of Southampton. He studied coastal processes and coastal hazards for the last 25 years. In particular, he has an international reputation concerning climate change in coastal areas, especially the potential impacts and possible responses. His research has involved studies across a range of scales from local, that is, for example, small towns, to the global. A distinctive dimension has been consideration of the coastal zone as a series of interacting systems with facilitate, which facilitates policy analysis. He's advised national governments, the UK, Netherlands, Singapore, the Maldives, and intergovernmental organizations on climate change and coastal issues including as a lead author to five reports of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change Assessment Process and a review editor in the most recent 2014 assessment. Currently is contributing to a series of research pro projects, including being the prin principal investigator on ICOST, which is a NERC, uh, National Environmental Research Council, in the UK, a ESPA Deltas, a recent project that has been funded is a, the DECMA project. He was awarded the Roger Revelle Medal by the Interna Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission in 2008. This recognizes outstanding contributions to the ocean sciences by inspired researchers who communicate their knowledge and global vision of the challenges facing our planet in order to shape a better future for humankind. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Robert Nichols. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction, uh, Scott. And it's a great pleasure to be here um, in LSU and um, to really talk about this issue of why might we want coastal resilience. And in Scott's introduction, he mentioned the idea of looking at systems. And I think a lot of what I'm going to say really came out of emerge from when we were thinking about how you might think about sea level rise impacts. Going back a long further than I'd like to remember now, um, we, we started to think about what are these sort of, what, what are different kinds of system properties that maybe are desirable, and coastal resilience sort of came out as, as one of them. And, you know, this is actually the paper that Scott mentioned, um, written in 1998. So it, also a message that when you write things, they sometimes come back. <laughs> in, in, uh, in that we held a meeting at the Royal Geographical Society um, in about 1997, actually, the meeting was held. And we were really, uh, there was quite a lot of interest in looking at this sort of as a unifying kind of concept uh, that might, uh, and desirable property uh, for supporting coastal management, which drew together people from a range of social science uh, and natural science and engineering backgrounds to sort of think through these kinds um, of, of issues. And so I want to really think through 
Coastal challenges. When we talk about the coast, why, you know, and think about it as a system, why do we actually, what are we trying to really deal with here? And I'm taking a global perspective. Then look at the idea, this idea of systems, sustainability, and I think the notion of wicked problems, which uh, you may have been sort of an idea that I wasn't aware of uh, back in 1998, but have become aware of more recently, and I think kind of encapsulates many of the issues we deal with in, co in coastal management. Then talk a little bit about coastal resilience coming out of that, and then some concluding remarks. So the coast, well, I guess, you know, this... I'm probably teaching you all to suck eggs here a little bit, but um, the coasts and people, well, population and economic activity is much greater than other areas of the, co of the Earth's surface. And just looking at this, this sort of uh, image here, which is just showing night lights, so all you're seeing there are the lights of human activity from space, it's quite clear that coastlines just stand out in the Mediterranean beautifully, that these line of lights just showing how much concentration of activity there is on coasts. And what we find actually, this is, this is done ages ago now, but 1993, that 23% uh, of the population in 1990 were within 100 kilometers of a coast and 100 meters elevation. So in other words, you, if you lived on a cliff that was 200 meters high on the coast, you weren't counted. You had to be below 100 meters elevation. So that's 23% of the world's population living at densities three times the global mean. Um, and then if you look in, this actually unpicks those areas, this is looking in kilometres, so this is 0 to 100 kilometres and 0 to 100 metres, so we can unpick that area, we called it the near coastal zone at that time, and you can see that these are bins, so basically as you move nearer to the coast, you get more and more people um, uh, with both distance and also with elevation. Now, coasts are fractal, so you've got, that's maybe cheating a bit, so it's maybe important to divide by the area and get a density, so that's the lines. And you can see that even when you correct for um, area near the coast, you see that the density is increasing as you move to the coast. Interestingly, peaking a little way inland, maybe not actually at the coast as the highest density, and note that relevant below 30 metres, there's a, a big concentration of people, and I think reflecting essentially populations in deltas. So I think that's quite relevant maybe to some of the interest in the room and one or two of the slides I'll show in a moment. And this sort of builds on that. This is work done for 84 developing countries um, by the World Bank. And this is showing you the area of land. About 2% of the, the, the land is within 5 metres of sea level. And but in those countries, um, we find disproportionately more agricultural area, but particularly people, um, <coughs> GDP, and urban area um, within uh, that, uh, five, you know, nearly 10% um, within five meters in these 84 developing countries. So coasts really do concentrate human activity, because when you think about it, coasts are only a small part of the Earth's surface. And why do we care about them so much? Well, I think we all, we all implicitly know this. But here we're sort of quantifying it and actually putting numbers on it and really bringing out what we instinctively know. And then, as well as that, that's a snapshot. That's just an observation of our state today. Well, we're dealing with interesting change. And, well, people. I mean, there's maybe important <coughs> trends with population, that there's more people on the coast. And the best numbers we have is that coastal populations are growing at twice the global rate. So, in other words, there's a migration of people towards the coast. Um, those people are moving to cities. We have an urbanizing coastal zone, so we have a gro big growth in cities. So the new residents are not they're, not, they're not moving there to be farmers, they're moving there to live in cities. And we also have things like increasing tourism, recreation, and retirement. Some of these are good problems, of course. People are living longer, we're wealthier, but we're still putting pressure um, on the coast in terms of these processes. Coasts, in many cases, are sinking, again, not universally, but subsiding, densely populated deltas tend to be sinking. You all know this very well. But if you go to Asia, especially in urban areas, so that's a very, it's a fun, I'd say, you know, we talk about climate-induced sea level rise. Over the 20th century, this was probably a much bigger process affecting people, and right now, than climate-induced sea level rise. In the future, that may be different. We have 
ports and harbors, globalization of trade and international shipping routes. Again, all it, it doesn't it goes through coastal areas. You know, I mean, I was said after up uh, it was um, you know Katrina had such big effects in part because it also damaged lifelines for the whole of the interior of the United States. And so the, the really importance of, of this globalization, which is ongoing, global trade volumes continue to grow. We see degrading coastal habitats and declining ecosystem services from those um, around the world. That's again a kind of global phenomenon, often again linked to maybe direct human destruction. We see increasingly costly coastal disasters. So we see, we see more, again, lo loss of lives, actually, fortunately, probably taking the fall, but we certainly see larger numbers. And Katrina and Sandy uh, in the US are two very good examples to, you know, to illustrate that, that they're you know, two of the most costly storms in US history. And then often what people talk about, climate change and sea level rise, I mean, it's important. But lots of other things are going on in, in when we're thinking about how the coast um, is changing. In the, as I made the comment, I mean, in the 21st century, this is probably going to become pretty important. But right to date, I think it hasn't been quite so important. And also, how society deals with these problems. We increasingly can simulate and sort of have virtual disasters. But in reality, we react to real events. We don't, there's not much proactive response and, and, and so, we, so, so we, we tend to drive with the rear view mirror when we're thinking about coastal management. Maybe that's changing a bit but I mean and one of my goals I suppose is I'd like to really try and change this one because clearly that, that, that could make a huge difference but if you look at empirically what's happening in the world we still tend to react. Looking at some of those issues in detail this is out of the IPCC um, fifth assessment report and just shows uh, for the different re um, reference representative concentration pathways two different pathways for sea level in the future well I suppose it's saying it does show what's happened in the past so this is back to 1700 I like this picture because it does show you the historic and the um, and the projections into the future and it shows different types of data so sea level was pretty flat um, it starts to rise um, in the 19th century, continues through the 20th century. There are different types of data there. Some of these are geological, then tide gauges, then satellite observations. And in the future, we expect it to continue to rise. And if concentrations keep on growing, it's going to accelerate. Um, so, you know, maybe up to a, a sort of meter rise in the um, in 21st century and the sort of the high end. And when we think about it, there's uncertainty. And this paper, I'm not endorsing this paper, it's just got a very clear title. But these types of things get written, and um, I'm not saying it's right, but people are observing maybe there are some rapid changes in the cryosphere. This is in Antarctica. That's where you can get a lot of sea level rise from. So it brings out the point, there's a tale of uncertainty. So these things are very, very uncertain. Maybe we'll be lucky and we won't see much sea level rise. Equally, we might see an awful lot. Um, and so therefore, we're dealing with a very uncertain problem going into the future. In part, it's linked to future emissions. In part, we just don't understand how these systems respond to global warming. So there are sort of fundamental scientific uncertainties. This idea of land sinking is also important. We looked at 136 cities around the world with the OECD after Katrina. Well, these are the cities with more than a million people in them in 2005 to really look at to try to understand where was sort of their flood exposure and flood risk. Um, and of these, about a quarter we identified were in areas where you might get significant substance due to, you know, the geological conditions were right for drainage and groundwater extraction to cause very significant substance. And they're all shown here. And what's, I think, very, when you look at this, is to see the cities in um, Asia, and this is the maximum substance in the 20th century, so this is observed, well, up to the present time, four meters in Tokyo, two meters in Tianjin, three meters in Osaka. So there's quite a lot of places where there's lots of people and assets which are sinking substantially. These areas have mainly been protected, so they're, still, they're all still there, but they've experienced, you know, this is, this, is, this is again very challenging, and these are some of the numbers that you kind of see with a place like Tokyo. So no, no, nothing much happening before 1900, rapid substance due to groundwater withdrawal. In about 1970, they came in policies to stop that substance very successfully. Jakarta more recently started subsiding, 
and not much is happening to the trend. And as far as I know, to, to this day, um, the Jakarta continues to subside at very fast rates. And again, even you can get substance in ways that you don't necessarily expect. This shows the um, Japan post the uh, tsunami of 2011, and um, the whole coast sank tectonically by about one meter in that event. So it's an instantaneous event, but similar things have happened after the Alaskan earthquake, and you think you, similar things could happen on parts of the west coast of the United States. And this gentleman here is just showing you, this is raising the, um, the dock side shown here, which is flooding every high tide because of the substance, um, back to an operational level. So you can get these changes from multiple causes. This is a one-off, it obviously won't happen again there in the future, but... Um, and when we think about, you know, erosion, um, and then sort of some of the sort of hazards that come out of these changes for people, this is the south coast of England. I live in the distance there, that's the Isle of Wight where I actually live. <laughs> um, you get erosion, and sometimes if we are sort of smart with erosion, it's not much of a problem. You can just let it go ahead. These, these cliffs are going back. Um, a bit of land's been lost, but the land isn't worth very much. The path can be moved, and um, it's quite a manageable sort of problem. But when you go to the Gold Coast of Australia, or many places in the world, but it really, it's a lovely picture, clearly erosion here is, a, again, a phenomenon, but they, they, they're, they're having to, you, the consequences of erosion here are extremely costly with you know, when the front rows are actually often your most valuable property, and, the, and, and, and your biggest properties, because people want the views. Uh, and obviously this is, this is mirrored um, all around uh, the world. And then issues like flooding, and again, I mean, this is in the context of uh, this setting. I mean, obviously this is a picture you're all too unfortunately familiar with, but showing um, New Orleans after uh, Katrina in 2005. But there have been many coastal floods, and everywhere you go, those coastal floods are remembered. So in Britain, the 1953 storm surge is our storm that we always talk about. Flooded the whole east coast of England from, the, from Yorkshire down to Kent, killed, 300 and, killed more than 300 people. This is, just, this is the death toll in one particular place, Canby Island, which was a hot spot um, uh, for deaths uh, in, in that event. Uh, and the Netherlands was also unfortunately affected in that event. Over nearly 2,000 people died there, the areas of land that are flooded. And again, certainly there's a, a mindset that never again. So that you know, our policy goal in Britain, our policy goal in the Netherlands, is to make sure that this never happens again. And go to Germany, Hamburg, 1962, not a flood that's so well known, because it hasn't really been written about so much in English, but again, an event very similar to the 53 event, 300 odd people were killed in Hamburg. There were no sort of warning systems in these days, so people just didn't know a flood was coming. So, I mean, that's the huge change with the death toll. At least we know these events are coming. It doesn't stop damage, but at least um, it preserves uh, life. And most recently, um, Hurricane Sandy um, in New York uh, and, and the damage both in the city, but also in the environs around the city in the sort of greater uh, in the greater sort of New York um, area. Uh, and again, a lot of discussion now about what we can do about in response to flooding in New York. And I was just to come back from a meeting in University of Virginia where you know, both Katrina and Sandy were discussed um, at great length in a sort of US context. And just sort of, you know, this is, this is sort of modeling now, but this looks at from that OECD study, you can actually look at what's the risk, what's the expected annual losses in 2005. So this is a, this is a projection of expected annual losses under current conditions. And the top 20 cities in the world, actually in the US context, very relevant fact, there's an awful lot of concentration of risk on the east and gulf coast of the United States. Um, it really stands out. Uh, and also in Asia. Um, in terms of, in terms of, so again, big risks, which I think you're very well aware of. But they, they got the, but many cities that have not been flooded recently are in that category. Obviously, I guess one of the key ones maybe Norfolk, Virginia, which is and, and the Hampton Roads region, which uh, is also known for an area to be experiencing quite rapid rates of sea level rise at the moment because the land is sinking there too, uh, about about sort of five millimeters per year of sea level rise. There's a lot of different challenges. And how can we best think about these challenges um, and really um, think about addressing them in a way that um, 
is, uh, uh, is um, effective. And I think this idea of thinking about, well, thinking about the coast as a system is important, recognising the multiple drivers, not trying to focus on one thing. I always say, you go to the pub, and you get the, and you know, you've got a problem, and the guy in the pub will always come up with the one driver that's causing it. If we do this, the problem goes away. Well, that's not going to happen with coasts. We've got multiple problems, um, and we want to, and I think the wicked problems are defined at the moment, and if, if we're going to attain sustainability, I think that's really what we're going to have to do. And when we think though, if we want about coastal management challenges, and this is kind of what we were thinking back in 1998, we've got to integrate, if we're going to think about the systems view, we've got to think about the physical, the social and economic processes of the coast, as, and the management pro processes. We've got to recognise these processes are dynamic, and they're coupled with high uncertainty. So the issue of increasing coastal damages, for example, what's causing that? Well, you know, um, again, people often link the growth in damages to sea level rise. Well, I think probably it's fundamentally more stuff on the coast, actually. Maybe it is one driver. Although there's a, an interplay substance in some cities it, 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 it is driving it. So, but these processes are dynamic. So the, the risks in cities are changing with time. And yet we're often treated as static. And, you know, kinds of the kinds of examples of coupling is, you know, we, erosion and flooding. Certainly in the UK, we recognise that often we've really done a great job. Those cliffs that were eroding, we've tried to protect them. But that means that the beaches are reduced in size because the sediment source is the cliffs. And therefore, down drift, areas that are flood risk have smaller beaches in front of them and they're more readily flooded. So these, these things are coupled and, the, and actually the flood damage is much larger than the erosion we're avoiding in terms of economics. So, um, or deltas, again, very pertinent talking in LSU, but you know, the issue of upstream catchments, how they're coupled to their upstream catchments, dams, loss of sediment uh, are, are pretty profound in the changes that have occurred. And we also have aspirations, I suppose, we, have, we, have, we also have a society that now is asking us, they, this word sustainability is used a lot, going back to 1992 when I sort of started doing, started on this journey, um, one of the first things I was, I came to the United States and worked here for five years in 1990, and in 1992 I found myself writing a document for the Unsaid Conference on climate change and coasts. Um, that, you know, all the world's governments went along and signed up to that, and there's been a lot of ongoing discussions, nationally and internationally, and currently we have the Sustainability Development Goals, have, have been agreed, again, and are now internationally agreed what they actually mean, but this is a big agenda, um, which, um, which, you know, is sort of coming from, the world wants this, sometimes I'm not sure they necessarily ask, know what they're quite asking for, but they do what they do, they think they want it. But it leads to this idea of wicked problems, and this is straight out of Wikipedia, so this is just a very <laughs> a good source. Um, but if you're not familiar with, with, with um, what a wicked problem is, because I think coastal problems, and I think many problems maybe that are difficult to solve, tend to be wicked. So they're, you know, the problems are, are difficult or impossible to solve because they're incomplete, contradictory, and challenging, that are often difficult to recognise. Wicked here means they're not the notion that they're hard to resolve, not that they're evil, <laughs> okay? Um, and there's, but basically they're complex interdependencies. The effort to solve one aspect may create, reveal or create other problems. And I think, you know, you, we can debate whether coastal problems are wicked, but I think we're probably, these, these types of characteristics will say, well, it's not so far from the kinds of problems I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with in my, in my day job. And this recognition that when you try and the guy, the guy in the pub that wants to, with his one solution, that will generate new problems. And, you know, and this is, again, the defining characteristics of a wicked problem. The problem's not understood until after the formulation of a solution. So you're learning by doing. Um, the no stopping rule. Solutions are not right or wrong. Each one's novel and unique. Each solution is a one-shot operation. We probably have no given alternative solution. Again, we can debate these things, but... It's, it's trying to get across the notion that, um, in, that, that maybe in looking at coasts, I sometimes think about the medical analogy, maybe rather than trying to solve coastal problems, we should be trying to diagnose them using a kind of medical analogy. 
not think we can solve it, which is again a very humbling thing to say, because I'm the coastal engineer, we solve things, don't we? We fix things. But, well maybe if we step back and say, um, if we're going to actually ultimately fix things, maybe we've got to diagnose them first. Um, and so I think this is an area where, you know, I don't feel, well I think it's worth thinking about, about that characteristic. And, we, again, thinking about this idea of coastal resilience, we were thinking very much about sort of systems, diagrams, and sort of coastal systems, and this idea of co-evolution, that the, we tend to think of people being at the mercy of nature. It's the hunter-gatherer society, isn't it? So, uh, but in fact, um, when we, was, we began to realize, well, actually, there's a feedback, because human beings are changing the coast. We are building harbours, we're dredging channels, we're doing beach nourishment, etc. We're, 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 we're building dams and catchments. We're having quite a lot of effect on the, um, on the natural system. So it's, it's coupled. And hence, the evolution of these two maybe aren't independent. And with time, that arrow from people is getting stronger. You know, nowadays, in fact, there's this debate, aren't we? Are we now in a new geological area called the <laughs> Anthropocene? Because humans now are the biggest geological agent on the planet, and we're leaving deposits that, you know, apparently the, the argument is that geology, if you come, come down to the earth in a million years' time, you'll be able to drill a hole and find deposits in this period, and you'll recognize that they're different from those that went before, because humans' effects are so, so profound. Um, and also, you'll see words coming in here, sensitivity, exposure. This is adaptive capacity. These are some of the terms that we're trying to think of. What are the system properties? that we need to characterize natural systems and the socioeconomic systems. And, and, and um, this was back in sort of the 1990s we were doing this. So these are some, although the word adaptive capacity now is still very much used, because it actually at this time was rather um, a, new, a new concept. And I suppose the point here that when we're thinking about these, these, these systems interact, there's also boundary conditions affecting this. So again, depends on how you define your system. It's probably defined relatively by the problem. If you think about the Mississippi Delta, the boundary conditions, storms, um, catchments, and multiple stresses sort of influencing. So, so that the, uh, the um, system's operating at multiple scales. And kind of a thinking with deltas, again, with the, with the with the, the sort of being in LSU and being in the Mississippi Delta, that um, when we think about sea level rise um, and how, again, a one, a simplistic view of sea level rise effect on Bangladesh, that here it is today, we raise sea level 1.5, this has just come straight off the web, number of people living in that area, the amount of land affected, but it's treating, it's treating a delta like it's concrete, isn't it? You know, just raising it, submergence, it gives you a first order indication of what's going on, but all we can think about it rather more, in a rather more realistic way, which is what we're doing in the Esper Deltas project, where we're actually looking at the, um, how people live there, the governance aspects. There are people there, demography, economics, and poverty. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, we, we, we've done household surveys there to look at how people use, this is about ecosystem services and how people use ecosystem services and a whole suite of biophysical models that um, capture, you know, from climate, through the catchments, through the Bay of Bengal, through to the landscape that you're dealing with, and then joining that all together, some kind of integration process, which I'm going to give a whole lecture on this slide, really, and what's around it. I have done already today to other people in the room, uh, but making the, making the point that this representation gives much more complex behavior than that slide I was showing you before. Just a, and, and this is kind of more realistic. And this, so again, a systems view of how a delta might evolve for a particular problem, ecosystem services and poverty alleviation. So now we move on to the idea of resilience and kind of coastal resilience and sort of system state parameters of the coastal zone. And this is my, these are sort of my ideas um, back in 1998, really. Well, take a holistic view of the coastal system, including the interaction of between natural and human subsystems. That's, that's 
if we're going to take the system view, we need to be doing that. Um, so again, and, and, and this idea of needing a systems perspective. But then, as soon as you start to think about a system, I think you start to think, well, what are the desirable system parameters? What would you like this system to, to, to have? And the idea of resilience, or literally the ability to bounce back, that's what resilience means, isn't it? If you literally, resilio, I think, is to bounce back. Um, struck us as very, very desirable. Or, again, a self-organizing ability of the system to survive and counter change, usually via negative feedback. But I stress that, the idea of self-organizing, that was our mindset at the time. Um, and we thought of other properties, we thought of properties like resistance, which is different. So, you know, resilience, did, we, did, we, we didn't think of a levy or a dike as, resi as resilient. We saw it more, we saw that was resistance. We weren't saying that resistance wasn't a good thing, it's just a different kind of property of the, we, we were trying to stop change happening. So I'm not going to go into other desirable system problems here, but recognising that when you start thinking about it this way, and the word resilience now has evolved, as we'll see in a moment. Um, so it, 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 I think its definition has, has become much broader uh, than this, and maybe is trying to encompass all, uh, an overarching definition. Because if you look, and you go now, and again, I just did this for, for the talk, you know, just sort of, sort of start Googling coastal resilience, you find a lot of stuff on the web. You know, just, these, these are just two, just two you know, there's a NOAA, a, a NOAA website, and this is, the, I think, from the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, so you find both government and, um, you know, foundations really endorsing coastal resilience. It's clearly coastal resilience and New Orleans is certainly there. The Rockefeller Foundation have been working in cities all around the world. Um, but then what does actually, and, and I suppose if we keep on going, uh, the, this idea of bouncing back comes through. This is sort of the, 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 the NOAA idea of bouncing back, I think, uh, which would be consistent with what, what I was saying. But I've just been at a workshop in, um, in Virginia, and um, we were talking ab about um, coastal problems, and the word resilience was being used in every second slide, really. It was a very, <laughs> very popular word. And I did decide that, again, I was giving this talk, so I thought, well, what does resilience mean? And most people were admitted it. They weren't, it wasn't very precisely defined. So I think there is a sort of weakness in how resilience has evolved a little bit. That it's good to have this idea of, uh, of, of, of bouncing back, but what does that really actually um, mean? The US Army Corps of Engineers, they sent me a, def a definition of resilience. This comes from, I think, from an executive order from, from the United President um, to dealing with climate change. And it's very broad, so the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions and withstand, respond, and recover rapidly from disruptions. So, prepare and plan, absorb and withstand, recover and adapt to be more successfully resilient in the future. So I think quite desirable, but it's very, it's now become, to my mind, rather broad. And I suppose when I was thinking about coastal resilience, we were probably thinking at the level of what of a concept at one, the level of you know so we were thinking the ability to bounce back, the ability to resist. So, so I think you can think of this is sort of taking it as an umbrella of all aspects of planning um, for a disaster. And I'm sort of I, I, I suppose the danger here is that. A concept like this means that people in the room are using the word, but they mean different things, isn't it? That's the danger, really. If you, it doesn't really matter um, if they're not using coastal resilience, as I defined it in 1998. That's not, that's not relevant. What worries me a little bit is that it's become a very broad concept, and do we actually know what we mean by coastal resilience? And in the UK, um, I think I spelled resilience wrong there, haven't I? Sorry. Um, and this is from the Cabinet Office. Um, and um, again, we have a definition of resilience in the UK government, so we're no different. So I'll just say it's, it's just to make the point, you know, just define infrastructure resilience, community resilience, business resilience, corporate resilience. And uh, I'm, on, I'm sitting on a panel looking now at flood resilience and how we enhance it post the, um, 
post the, post the floods. But again, it's all it's it's a broad concept of what uh, the word resilience uh, what resilience actually means. And so, if we look at different things we can actually do, um, it's interesting to ask: Are these um, resilient? Now, these are just at the IPCC. That this, these ideas were around since 1990. How can you adapt to sea level rise? But how can you adapt to coastal hazards? You can apply these ideas more generally than sea level rise. That you can retreat, you can accommodate, or you can build, you can protect, you can build a barrier. Um, are these all resilient responses? Um, if we look at, at adaptation in coastal cities, we can think of a menu of things that are kind of sensible to do in a city. Each city will, will have a different mix out of this portfolio, but I would suggest probably all cities will do these to some varying degree, that you'll probably upgrade protection and also raise land. I think that's actually underrated. I mean, you can actually just build out of it. Um, uh, I'm seeing in the Maldives, they're building islands and they're building them higher than the natural islands. That seems quite a smart thing to do if you live in a very low-lying setting. Making sure you don't subside. Land use planning so that you don't have, your, you don't have vulnerability in the in the lowest areas, for example, maybe you put parks in the low lying areas. If you build buildings, making them flood proof and flood resilient so they can get back to business quite quickly. And that, to me, very much the idea of resilience, thinking there, selective, maybe selective relocation away from existing city areas. I don't honestly know that really happening in a planned way anywhere. Maybe it's happening in, by default in some places, but certainly it's an option to think about. Flood warning and evacuation, that's cheap and should be done everywhere, and I think it is pretty much done everywhere. And also learning from each other, exchange and talking with other cities um, so that experiences like Tokyo's experience of substance I was showing you earlier is shared with all the other cities that subside. How do they deal with it? Um, that's, I think, also important and uh, an important thing to do. But are these all sort of resilient responses? Um, there's certainly more valid responses. And seeing adaptation as a process, so that um, if we look at adaptation, we recognize that um, we go through a cycle that, you know, before we adapt, we probably need to get some information in the awareness. We have to see there's a problem. Maybe there's a reactive adaptation, maybe there's a disaster. Um, Maybe we, maybe we do some analysis and we see there's a potential problem. Then we might plan and design some kinds of solutions. We might implement. And then what we often forget to do, to monitor and evaluate what's happened, rather than just assume the problem's solved. Lots and lots of feedback as well. So the, all, the way, all, the way, all the way along here, there's potential for feedback. So as you move down here, you might design something and you find that people don't like it. So you, have to go, you, can, so you can go back and you can change your design um, and uh, produce something that um, people, uh, people actually like. For example, or, set, or fulfills other criteria, because adaptation will exist in the context, so you have to address all the other criteria that are relevant for, for that, for, for the problem's response. But then, look at the Thames Barrier. So a lovely piece of uh, coastal engineering, you know, built, in, built as a response to 1953. I mentioned this flood. Um, earlier, um, it's, it's, it's closed, this is the hundredth time it was closed, this is meant to flood, so it's protecting upstream, so the, here, this is on a big, a big levee that's keeping the sea out, it's all part, it's, all part, it's just an element in a much bigger defence system, um, so, and, and so this area down here is designed to flood when the barrier closes. And back to this question, is this resilience? I'm just asking you really, is that resilience? Um, I, I tend to sort of see it as resistance myself, but anyway, and effective resistance, and I say I'm not being critical of resisting, I'm just making the distinctions as I, as, as I see it. But of course, we can think this, this system has been experiencing, um, is, ex is experiencing sea level rise. Um, sea levels in London have risen about 20 centimetres in the last 100 years, numbers not unlike the changes across much of the planet. And if we think about how, well, what, that system has a design life to 50 years, 2030-ish. Um, I don't say it's going to fall down, but in, the, the idea was you'd have to do something more in 2030. Um, and now we know sea level is going to rise more rapidly than the people that built it thought it would. 
they were expecting some sea level rise, but not, not anything like as much as maybe could happen. And so, again, maybe, in a sense, rather than thinking about these big structures, thinking about a process of adaptation, this is what they've done in London, not worried about time, just put in different amounts of sea level rise that might occur. And just, and just started off going up almost to five metres, saying, what would we... Um, what could we do against different amounts of sea level rise? So you can, you know, the existing system can deal with a bit, you can raise the defences, you can do what, there are other things like over-rotate the barrier, nobody knows why you can over-rotate the barrier, but you can, you can get a bit more height out of it. Um, you've got flood storage, so all these sort of, the, 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 there are a number of options. Interestingly note that, I think this is, shows a good point about sea level rises on the side, for small amounts of sea level rise, well not maybe small, even for quite big, this is two metres, you've got quite a few things you can do, as it gets more and more, you can got one option, a new barrage. At some point, you're almost pumping the Thames over a fixed defence um, if, you keep, if, it, if the sea keeps on rising. Or you move London. This is an option that's not on the diagram. <laughs> but clearly, that's your choice um, you know, as the sea rises. It turns out that this seems like it's affordable, so that, you know, that we can go, we can think for the next 100, 200 years in London, we, can, we, we, we have options. And so, therefore, we can uh, actually um, we can actually respond to this, and you can actually sort of find a pathway through this. So maybe so. In terms of saying is the barrier res uh, resilient, I think maybe this kind of planning is maybe a little more resilient because <laughs> it's thinking about a process. Um, and, 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 and this actually cost 15 million pounds essentially to produce this diagram. I should say so. It's worth, but. And bearing in mind that the, these upgrades to infrastructure will cost billions, it's actually a pretty smart investment. And I, this is something I'd advocate every city around the earth on the coast should be really thinking through uh, in this way. It, the numbers we're actually expecting by 2100, that's the dash line, that's the expectation of what we're expecting. They were worried about maybe high end. Well, what could sea level rise be in the worst? That's this H++. So that's the expected range that we'll actually have to deal with in the next hundred years. Could even be less than that, actually. But, uh, but, 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 but it, that's sort of bringing in the time dimension. So, I think in terms of thinking about resilience, I'm not sure I see a piece of a wall as resilient, but maybe it can sit in a resilient system where we, where we have the, sort of the planning um, around it. And it, it's much more to do with the system than it is with the Pacific piece um, of infrastructure. Also, it's worth thinking, I suppose, about limits to adaptation um, in coastal cities. Um, many people say, well, we have to retreat, don't we? That's often a good argument. We can't hold back the sea. Well, physical engineering limits, bluntly, I don't think there are any. If you give an engineer enough money, they'll build you something. It's about, it's about, it's about resources. If you, but if you want a 40 meter high levee that will, that will stand there against 40 meters of water, you can do it. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a technical issue. There are limits, but money, clearly, have you got enough money? Do you want to do that? So I'm not saying you should, but I think that um, to, to, to bear that in mind, um, economic and financial limits, what can be afforded, that clearly changes the calculus of what how much resource an engineer might be given to deal with um, a particular problem, and also social political limits. I think in the US there's a much stronger resistance to protection than there is in Europe, for example. Maybe that's linked to economics partly, because land values are higher, etc. But we were just talking about that earlier. But I think there's also, you know, confidence, attitudes to risk, timing, culture. Um, don't underestimate those factors as well. I think so. It doesn't, so what you might do in Europe is not what you might do in North America. And it's probably for, for, for good, good, um, good, good reasons. So, <laughs> concluding remarks. Pretty obvious first remark. Coastal management's challenging. It, you know, many of the people in the room are very much engaged with this, and I think um, there's no, there's no. I think there's no doubt that this is. I think very exciting issue, but very challenging to really sort of actually solve it. And I think this partly reflects the complex systems which the coast responds, comprises rather, you know, really 
and including maybe us being an important part. You know, we've got to address the politics of the situation. But um, then coastal resilience, I think, in this context of looking at these complex systems, can be seen as a desirable system parameter, the ability to bounce back. You know, a feature. So I, I really think that we ought to try and recognise coastal resilience, this ability um, to bounce to bounce back, and something that we can harness in that, um, you know, a, you don't tell a salt marsh to grow more if sea level rises. All you need to do is, in a sense, facilitate it. If you increase its sediment supply, that is increasing its resilience. If you give it space to migrate. So, so there, there, there are things that we can do that encourage these. Or maybe another kind of resilient property of in Britain, we think a resilient property is, is actually our insurance, because that gives people the ability to rebuild after a disaster, or maybe markets, because of pr pricing. These are, these are things that no politician really controls. So insurance, in, maybe politicians do control a bit, in, 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 even in the UK, because it's, it's normally private, but there is certain discussions between government. But um, these, are, these are things that um, are not controlled by politicians. And I think... Well, coastal resilience is now widely recognised and desired, but it's often as a broad and I think ill-defined concept. And I sort of worry a little bit, does that destroy some of the power of recognising these ideas? Um, so I think the challenge to actually operate, operationalise resilience remains to really, I think most people see it as a good thing, but to actually, what does that really mean on the ground, to my mind, remains um, a challenge. So with that, so, so again, this article, I never thought in 1998, um, 18 years later, I'll be standing in LSU talking about this, but here I am. So happily take any questions. Thank you.